How's it going everybody? Recently I decided to build the Virginia Tech solar kiln using the free plans you can find online. And so this video is going to be going over a bunch of the inconsistencies that you're going to find in those plans as well as a general how-to so you can build one of these yourself if you want one. The other thing I'm going to be fixing in this project is the price tag. If you want to build this project exactly the way the plans call for, you're going to end up spending above $2,000, which for me is a little bit steep. So I'm going to change a few items here and there and bring the price tag down as much as I can, so this will also be the cheapest option I can make for a permanent solar kiln. If you want to follow along, the plans to the Virginia Tech solar kiln will be in the description. The first thing you're going to need to do after you acquire all of your materials is construct a floor frame. This is going to be made up of 2x8s. However, I decided to make these out of 2x6s to save some money. For this, you're going to want to use anything that's exterior grade, since this is going to be exposed to the elements. You can either use something like cedar or pressure treated lumber for this step. All of these just get nailed together. Luckily, in my situation, I don't actually have to build this to code because I am well under the square footage for my area. But you're going to have to check with your local restrictions and make any changes necessary to fit within your code. And since I'm building these within my restrictions, that means I can build this however I want. Once again, I am completely and utterly unsupervised. <laughs> when I started this project, my original intention was to buy a nail gun to nail these pieces together, but I ran out of funds pretty early and I wasn't able to do that, so instead I've just been using this hammer to nail everything together. If you have an option, definitely bring a nail gun. For the floor of the kiln, I decided to use this 3 quarter inch OSB underlayment, and this needs to be cut to fit before I take the floor outside and put it in its final position. The flooring can be placed on top of these six exterior grade 4x4s and everything just gets toenailed into place. Okay, I'm gonna pause what I was doing right here. Before I put the underlayment down, I was supposed to install some one inch foam insulations under the floor. Do not forget this step because this caused me a big headache later on in the project and you can avoid that if you don't forget. Now at this point, the OSB can now be nailed or screwed into the floor. Since we're not building this to code, I should mention that it really doesn't matter whether you use nails or screws for this project, but I guarantee that no matter how I do it, there's going to be someone in the comments disagreeing with what type of fastener I should use where. And that's basically because even though screws will hold better, the nails are going to be able to handle racking forces a lot better. So the way I did this is I set up all the framing to be used with nails and all of the sheet goods get screwed into place. But because we're not doing this to code, it really doesn't matter. You can make this however you like. When everything was said and done, I used about 500 nails for this project and about 400 screws, which was a lot more than I was honestly expecting, but uh, by accordingly. I did it! The next bit of framing that needs to be built are the two sides to the kiln, which have this 45 degree angle roof section on it. If you feel like getting complicated, you can customize this angle to the area of the country you live in. Technically, in my area, I should be setting this angle to about 43 degrees for efficiency's sake, but 45 degrees is so much easier to build, most people just go with that. Don't forget, you have to make two of these. The next piece we need to make is the front of the kiln. This piece is a bit more complicated because we have a header to work with. For some reason, when I was buying all of my lumber, I accidentally bought a 2x10 rather than two 2x8s, so that's what I ended up installing. The way this section is supposed to fit together is you put down one of the 2x8s and then a half inch piece of plywood the same size and then another 2x8 and then everything just gets nailed together. Because I used the 2x10s, my doors ended up a bit shorter than they were designed to be, so make sure you buy the right materials and you won't have that problem. I'll be installing the second header later in the video. Next we need to make the two doors, and it's a good idea to make sure all of these pieces are cut to fit and leave yourself about a quarter inch of an opening around the doors. This will save you a lot of headache down the road when you have to fit the doors into place. The next piece we're going to be making is the back of the kiln, and this is by far the easiest one to put together. Just like everything else, make sure everything is square as you nail it together. The next part that needs to get nailed together is the roof, and this piece was such a headache. On the plans, it shows that all of the pieces being nailed together are at 90 degrees, but if you look at the left of the plans, there's this extra little piece, and this is actually the side view of the roof. Unfortunately, this piece wasn't labeled in the plans. And on top of that, this part of the plans actually doubles as your cut list, and so this piece really didn't make any sense in the context of the plans. Since this issue happened, I've talked to a handful of people who actually draw up plans and blueprints for a living, and they told me the same thing. This really should have been labeled in some way. But it's really not that big of a deal because I just ended up pulling the pieces back apart and I built it the right way before installing it. One of the few things that everyone that knows me can agree on is I am extremely stubborn and I don't like to ask for help. While I was putting all these framing pieces into place, even though I was surrounded by great neighbors and I could have asked for help at any point, I never did. <laughs> 
If you have the opportunity to ask for help during any part of this process, the whole thing will go more than twice as fast if you have someone helping lift the pieces, or holding them while you nail them into place, or even just spotting you while you lift. And that actually goes for this entire build. If you're planning on tackling this project, you could probably do the whole thing in less than a month worth of weekends if you have help. But unfortunately, this project took me almost two months to build because I decided to do the whole thing by myself. So keep that in mind. This is at minimum a two-person build. <laughs> And this is when Mark showed up and helped me install the second half of the header. Longtime viewers of the channel may remember that Mark was the one who helped me originally set up my logging trailer. Now that the main body of the frame is built, I can start focusing once again on the roof. You know, I had no idea that the cat did that until after I was watching the footage back. Sorry cat. I used a bucket full of tools as a counterweight to lift the roof into place. Then once everything was in place, it just all gets nailed together. Right here, you can also see that at this point, I'd finally bought myself a proper framing hammer. Up to this point, I've never used a proper framing hammer before, and this makes a world of difference when hammering in this many nails. My whole life, I've only ever used those cheap $8 hammers you get from the hardware store, and now I can prove that even though I'm still bad at hammering, a good hammer will still make you look like you know what you're doing. I'd like to reiterate that I'm not a framer. Once again, if you can afford it, go buy a nail gun. Now we can start focusing on the doors again. I decided to coat the doors in this half inch OSB and this part is going to be a bit controversial. Of course, if you want to, you can cut these with a circular saw before you screw them in place. But a much easier method that some people use in the construction industry is to use a flush trim bit. This means you don't have to measure or mark anything and you get a perfect custom fit every time. Now a lot of people who've used this technique will tell you that it's really hard on your router and it's really not advised, but in my defense, it makes it way easier and I don't have to do any math. If you copy this method, just be careful because you could easily burn up your router if you do it wrong, so proceed with caution. Now that we have the first side of the door sheeted, we can begin installing the insulation. For this project, I just use roll insulation because it's easy to install and it fits into the frame. One of the things that I'd considered at the beginning of this project but it didn't end up going with was designing these doors a bit different. I think a major improvement would be to build this with a frame that is one and a half inch thick with two by fours turned on their side with a one inch foam insulation instead of rolled insulation. And that would make these doors so much lighter and easier to use. After I installed these doors, they already sagged a little bit and they drag on the bottom plate of the kiln and I'll show you this a little bit later, but they were extremely difficult to install because of their weight. I think if I ever build this project again, I'm going to be building that lighter version of the doors rather than what I've built here, but that's just a personal preference. These doors do work well enough. Right here I'm using half inch OSB to cover the entire outside of the kiln, just like before these get screwed into place. A few of these pieces were a bit tricky to get up into the air with just one person, but I got them all up in the end. I made sure to keep everything on the front nice and flush with the OSB, but then this is where I realized I had screwed up. Alright, I'm not willing to admit that I've done anything wrong yet, uh, but whatever voiceover guy told you to do earlier uh, is definitely what you should be doing. I have to figure out how to get insulation underneath all of this, and it probably would have been easier before I put all the framing on. So now I have to figure out how to get this in the air, and I'm going to be using all of- whoop. All of this. This is the uh, poor man's kiln, and I'm going to be taking all the insulation off that. I'm going to be harvesting that, and that's all going to be filling in under here. I'm pretty sure the right thing to use would be one inch insulation, but whatever voiceover guy tells you is the right way to do this. Not what I'm about to do. I mean, I knew I was going to need insulation under the kiln at some point. You'd think I would have done that earlier. So the right way to do this would have been to get some one inch foam insulation and install it between the runners of the floor before putting the OSB underlayment down. Unfortunately, I completely forgot that step and now I have to lift this kiln into the air and I'm using the scrap foam insulation from the poor man's kiln I did last year and I did two layers of this between each of the runners. These can just get stapled into place. Luckily, I have this gantry that my dad and I built a few years back and it was perfect for lifting the kiln. 
We figured out that this thing has a weight capacity of about 2,000 pounds, but I'm honestly not sure how heavy the solar kiln is, and so I made sure to place some car ramps under the edge of the kiln just in case anything broke while I was under it. This actually worked out pretty well, but I wouldn't recommend it. Now we can finish installing all of the insulation on the inside of the kiln. A staple gun will make quick work of this part of the project. Just make sure to leave a space open in the middle of the frame above the header if you're going to be adding a thermal controlled fan the way I am. But I'll get into that a little bit more in a second. This sheet of plastic that I'm adding to the inside of the kiln is called a vapor barrier and this is very important to add so don't skip it. Since we're going to be dealing with humidity you want to make sure that there is a good barrier to stop any moisture diffusion through the walls of the kiln. If you skip using the vapor barrier, you're a lot more likely to get rot and mold on the insides of the kiln. Now we can finally install the thermal controlled fan. Now this is something that the original plans don't actually call for, but in my opinion, the extra expense is worth it because it's going to take this kiln from something you have to operate manually on a daily basis to something you can set and forget for several weeks at a time. If you want to, you can install the vents in your kiln the way the plans call for, but instead, in my opinion, this fan streamlines the entire process so much I can't imagine using the kiln without it. Once the fan is installed, I can staple some of the foam insulation around the fan, and it's time to cover up the entire interior of the kiln with the last layer of OSB. Now we need to make some sort of a frame to hold three 24 inch fans. To do this, I just made a frame out of two by fours and I evenly spaced the fans for the inside of the kiln. Then on the back of the frame, I screwed in a few thin pieces of OSB to act as a stop so that the fans wouldn't fall all the way through. Then I could make some brackets to hold the fans from the other side as well. In all honesty, the brackets that I'm making here are a bit overkill because if you wanted to, you could just use something as simple as a bungee cord to hold the fans in place that way. It's completely up to how you feel like doing it. Once I had everything assembled, I could take it outside and screw it into a place about 16 inches from the inside wall. If you measure everything correctly, you should be able to hit the second stud. Then, after putting the fans in place, I can install the brackets holding the fans firmly in place. And of course, because I had the fans in place, I had to test everything out to make sure everything was working. Since everything is working perfectly so far, I can finally finish up the roof. I needed to nail two rows of 2x4s into the roof frame so I had something to attach the polycarbonate to. This is something you could do earlier in the process if you want to, but I wasn't completely sure where I wanted these until everything was put together. And I'm really glad that I did this because now that I know for sure how much overhang I want on the bottom of the roof, I could measure my polycarbonate and see where the overlap is going to end up, and that tells me exactly where to put this top row of 2x4s. The reason that I need them specifically in that location is because I bought 8 foot lengths of this polycarbonate because of how much cheaper it was than the 12 foot pieces. If I had bought the 12 foot pieces I would have ended up with a bunch of scrap at the end of the project and that would have just been a waste of money. So my plan is to overlap the top section of the roof with another layer of polycarbonate. This is definitely the cheaper way of adding to the roof, but you could alternatively save time and effort by just buying longer roof panels. If you're trying to save money on this project, then OSB sheeting is one of the best ways to do that because you'll be spending less than a third of the price as an exterior grade plywood. But one of the biggest downsides is it doesn't always look the nicest, so I went over the entire surface with a 60 grit sandpaper, trying to make sure that everything is as flush as possible before putting on the paint. To increase the efficiency of the kiln, it's a good idea to paint the entire inside black, and it's also a good idea to get something that is exterior grade or waterproof. And in my opinion, you can't do any better than this driveway sealer. It's thick, waterproof, and black, which fits all the criteria for the inside of the kiln. I ended up finding this 5 gallon bucket of driveway sealer for only $20 at Menards and it seems like the perfect option for me. Eventually, I figured out that I could paint the floor easiest if I just spilled some on the floor and started pushing it around. You'll want to make sure that you have a really good covering over the entire inside of the kiln, but make sure you have a little bit left over because this OSB has a tendency to chip away if you're rough on it and you'll probably want to go back over and touch up a few spots at the very end. Now that the inside is all painted, we can paint the outside whatever color you want. Just make sure it's an exterior grade paint. 
When we were picking out the paint, my wife said that she wanted painted white to match our other sheds, but I had originally planned on painting the whole thing barn red because I thought that would look cool. And so of course I painted it white. And you know what? I think it looks so much better painted white. The last thing we would want is for it to look too awesome. And I think it's a great idea that we used a subdued color like white so that it wouldn't look too interesting. Come on up. Come all the way down. You look how clean it is. There you go. You did it. We are getting so close to finally being done with this build. We just need to install the doors and the roof. Like I said before, this would be a lot easier if you had two people helping, but instead of a helper, I had a gantry. But I was able to get the doors into place and get the hinges on. Then I can begin attaching the framing around the edges of the doors, and this is going to help make a seal around the doors. I cut a 1x2 spacer to help make sure everything was nice and evenly spaced, and then I can install the first frame. Then I can install the next piece of frame on the right door, making sure to have a 2 inch overhang on the inside of the door. You can also see right here that I sanded the door a little bit so that they would fit a little bit nicer. Next, I can install the frame on the left door flush with the one we just installed. And now that I have all the main pieces cut, everything else gets cut to fit. You can definitely skip this next step if you want to, but in my situation, I wanted to match the shed that I already had. And that shed had this diagonal piece in the middle, so the doors sort of make a V. This part is purely decorative, and you don't really need to do it. I also cut one of them backwards by accident, but that was easy enough to flip around. To install the roof, I needed a flat plane to work with, so I cut these triangles to fit inside the frame, that will give me something to attach the brackets to later. I added another triangle piece to the top of the kiln for the top brackets. Remember how earlier I said you can save a little bit of that driveway sealer for later steps? Since I neglected to do this and it's only for looks anyway, I decided to just use whatever spray paints I had in my cupboard to paint these black and match the inside of the kiln. And right here, you can see I switched over to a high heat grill paint. <laughs> it worked great. I also used this opportunity to go through and touch up a few other areas with the black paint. And while that was drying, I could go through and use up the rest of the white paint on the front of the kiln as well. Now that we're finally done with all of the painting, I can start installing some of these polycarbonate roof brackets. On this left side, I needed to screw the brackets in place just for alignment, but later on, I need to take these screws back out and install the screws again through the polycarbonate and into the same hole of the bracket. Then, working left to right, I can install all the polycarbonate roofing. I tried a handful of different ways to cut the polycarbonate, and to be honest, I never found a good way that leaves you a clean, accurate line that doesn't crack the material. The first thing that I tried were these shears, and although they did work, I didn't get a clean, accurate line with them. So when cutting all the pieces for the top gap of the roof, I decided to try using a jigsaw because I saw someone online have good luck with one. But this also didn't seem to work very well for me. I tried a variety of different tools off camera and never found a good solution, so if anyone has a good tip for cutting these polycarbonate panels, please let everyone know in the comments. I'd love to hear it. On mine, it's one of those things that you're not going to notice unless somebody points it out to you, but there's a lot of these little cracks all over the roof after I installed it, and I wish it was just a little bit cleaner. All of the pieces do overlap on mine a decent amount, so I'm really not worried about any water or heat going in and out, so it's really just an aesthetic issue. And the last piece I need to install for the roof is the ridge cap. I bought all of these polycarbonate roof pieces at Home Depot and they never had any of the ridge caps in stock, so I ended up just using some of the scrap pieces of the polycarbonate sheets, and this works well enough. But if you can get a proper ridge cap, that would be more ideal. At this point, the kiln is basically done. I just need to add a few finishing touches like the latch on the front door, and I need to run all of the cables for the fans. I just stapled all these to the walls and it's done. This kiln is designed to dry up to a thousand board feet of lumber at a time. Do not overfill this kiln. This is one of those mistakes I've seen so many times online, 
People will build a kiln like this and then completely overfill it. Keep in mind that any material you add into the kiln is going to act as a temperature sink, and that means the more material you add into the kiln, the less efficient it's going to be. Just because there's room doesn't mean that you should fit more lumber into it. The basic rule of thumb for this kiln is to stay under 1,000 board feet and you should be fine. So now that the kiln is finally done, how much money did it actually cost me to build this? In my situation, I already had a handful of these materials on hand, and so the entire project cost me right around $1,300. But if you're going to be buying all of these same materials new and follow all of the steps I showed in this video, it should cost right around $1,600 to do the entire project. So if you're following along, that means this version of the Virginia Tech solar kiln is about $400 cheaper than what they have in the plans. But if that is still too steep for you, you can go check out my poor man solar kiln build that I did last year, which only cost me about $200. It basically has the same design, it's just slightly less efficient, but it does get the job done if you only have a few loads to cycle through. And believe it or not, it actually dries the same number of board feet per load. The biggest difference between that one and the one I just built is this one is designed to last more than 10 years, and the poor man's kiln is only designed to last about one or two. So which one do you like better? Thank you all for watching. Catch y'all next time.